This week on Africa Weekly, we follow the refugees from South Sudan fleeing to neighbouring Uganda after an upsurge in fighting. Then we meet the African migrants who have made a home from home in Italy. And finally, we head to the South African city of Durban, which is being given a makeover in the hope of encouraging businesses to set up in the city. But first, here's a summary of the stories that made the headlines this week. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi declared a three-month state of emergency following twin church bombings that killed 45 people in two cities. The Islamic State group had claimed responsibility for the attacks in the Nile Delta cities of Alexandria and Tanta. Coptic Christians, who make up about one-tenth of Egypt's population, have been targeted by several attacks in recent months and have long complained of persecution and radical discourse against them in certain mosques and on Islamic satellite channels. Democratic Republic of Congo's new Prime Minister Bruno Tshisekedi held talks on creating a new government following his appointment by President Joseph Kabila. Kabila has faced strong opposition in the vast mineral-rich nation since December, when his second and final term officially ended but elections failed to be held. Thousands of South Africans marched against President Jacob Zuma in the capital Pretoria as pressure mounts on the head of state ahead of a no-confidence vote in Parliament. Zuma's recent sacking of respected finance minister Pravan Gordon unleashed public anger over government corruption scandals, record unemployment and slowing economic growth. Zambian opposition leader Hakayende Hichilema, who refused to accept defeat in last year's presidential election, has been detained on charges of treason. More than 100 armed police surrounded his house outside Lusaka and tear gas was fired shortly before he was taken into custody. As the head of the United Party for National Development, he's launched several legal attempts to challenge the August election which he says was rigged. Nigeria is marking the third anniversary since the abduction of 276 girls by the jihadist group Boko Haram in northeastern Nigeria on the 14th of April 2014. Despite rescue attempts by the Nigerian army, 195 schoolgirls from Chibok are still missing. A prominent Ugandan female academic and activist was charged with cyber harassment for calling President Yoweri Museveni a pair of buttocks in a Facebook post. University lecturer Stella Nyanzi has raised eyebrows in the conservative country for sexually explicit social media posts in which she's frequently criticised the president and his wife. Yes, I have written a lot, Your Honour, about those who rule us, about family rule, about nepotism, issues that would be offensive to those who are the offenders of this nation. However, Your Honour, I am not guilty of offensive communication. <laughs> Crossing no man's land between South Sudan and Uganda. For some, the final stretch is the hardest. David and his sister survived the Bajok attack. David says he'll never return. Me, I will not go back there again. Because I've seen, and I've seen with my naked eye, I will not go back there again. I better die somewhere held apart from South Sudan. It's a two-day walk to safety. More than 5,000 people from Pajok have escaped across this border. They've found security, but there's no comfort here. No shelters have been built, and the South Sudanese army is never far, pursuing refugees right up to the border crossing. Philip has been reunited with his family after escaping from the SPLA. The army took him prisoner and made him count the corpses in the streets. Philip insisted on burying them, he still has blisters on his hands from digging their graves. All about which I've counted is 85 dead body, which was sought by the government soldiers. And I managed only to, to bury 13 of them, the dead body. Throughout South Sudan's civil war, women have been targeted and rape used as a weapon. Pajok is no different. Those who are willing to speak tell of abductions, beatings and rape by government soldiers. I fell to the ground and he walked over me with his shoes. Then he pulled me to my feet and asked me to give him my daughter. I told him she wasn't my daughter, we were just fleeing together. He said I was lying. One of the soldiers took her away into a house next to us. The other one stayed with me outside. 
We were outside the door and we heard the girl crying. Yeah, why don't we lie? They wait to move to formal settlements. The refugees take shelter however they can. Uganda was always meant to be a temporary refuge, but for many South Sudanese, this may be home for years to come. The Calabrian village of Sant'Alessio was dying a slow death. Its young population had left to find work in Italy's north, leaving just 300 behind and the local economy in tatters. But a recent migration project has changed all that. In 2013, Sant'Alessio joined Italy's migrant reception network, which funds accommodation, food and other services for asylum seekers and refugees. Since then, dozens of people from Ghana, Iraq, Nigeria and Mali have spent up to a year here while their refugee papers are processed. Our mission is both humane and humanitarian. That's the most important thing. On top of that, I admit that welcoming refugees and asylum seekers has significant benefits. There's more life in the centre of our small village. Sixteen people in the village have found work related to the project. Sant'Alessio has also managed to keep its doctor employed and school gates open. It's also become a home from home for the migrants, many of whom spent time in overcrowded emergency reception centres before arriving here. The time I was in Maneo camp I was always thinking, even to know how to collect food is thinking. If you want to go and collect medicine, it's a problem. But here you call, and there's a doctor there. You call, doctor is here. And the locals have taken a shine to their guests. Many have their own experience of emigration and understand the challenges. Antonio Sacca spent 54 years away in Turin for work. They behave well, they're good people. If we need to work the land, we call them. They come and of course we pay them for it. They make themselves useful. The state allocates 45 euros a day for each migrant, most of which goes to the project organisers to cover its costs. So far, the unlikely relationship is working. Sant'Alessio offers companionship for those fleeing persecution or war, and the migrants bring fresh life to a decaying village. The project is so successful that four villages nearby are following its example. Sakile Malongo is painting life back into Durban's city centre. The artist is part of a project to make South Africa's biggest port town more attractive to both residents and businesses. Instead of like, just seeing all these um, grey or yellow painted buildings, you see something that moves you and something that's saying something to you and something that speaks to you, something that brings life to the city. The end of apartheid in 1994 led to an exodus of wealthier residents. Working class communities were left with a grim legacy, abandoned buildings, violent gangs and standstill traffic. Now Durban's authorities are on a mission to reinvent the city centre. We've taken the models of good practice from other cities and we've looked at our own city and say what do we need to do to turn the city around? How do we create jobs for young people? How do we use the creative industries? How do we stop flight of, well, of, 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 of tenants that are businesses from the city centre to other parts of the city? Several empty warehouses have been transformed into spaces for small businesses and restaurants. The project aims to woo potential investors, modernising the centre and making it a safer area. I think it's a great concept in making the city alive again and make it more attractive to the locals because the locals themselves aren't happy with it. There are also plans to modernize the city's public transport and build a new skyscraper. But it will take decades for Durban to realize its ambitions, faced with severe financial constraints. Last month the city lost the right to host the 2022 Commonwealth Games because it simply couldn't afford it. A Kenyan couple arrived home victorious in Nairobi after each won their respective races at the Paris Marathon. 
Kenya's Paul Lonyangata crossed the finish line in 2 hours, 6 minutes and 10 seconds, and his wife Purity won the women's race in a record time of 2 hours, 20 minutes and 55 seconds. The Marathon de Sable, one of the toughest races on earth, took place in southern Morocco, with hundreds of participants taking on the Saharan dunes over more than 250 kilometres in scorching temperatures. Next week on Africa Weekly, we explore illegal logging in Mozambique, which is increasingly on the rise. That's all from us at Africa Weekly. Until next week.